Hello, this is the suggested problem set 5.3, minimum suggested problems. Uh, these are the solutions to these problems mentioned here. Again, these are the minimum suggested. Please at least do this amount if you do any. So first off, we're starting with um, 7-Eleven. So you are testing an amusement park roller coaster with an empty car of mass 120 kilograms. A certain part of the track is a vertical loop with a radius of 12 meters, which indicates that it's supposed to be a circle. At the bottom of the loop, which we're calling point A, so let's go ahead and draw the loop. So my loop looks something like this. At the, and we have a cart going around it. So the mass of this cart is 120 kilograms. At the bottom of the loop, point A, so we'll say this is point A right here. We'll use a different color. So point A. The car has a speed of 25 meters per second, so VA will be 25 meters per second. At the top of the loop, point B, so up here, the speed is 8 meters per second, so VB is 8 meters per second. As the car rolls from point A to point B, how much work is done by friction? So, in order to answer this question, we are going to take a look at energy. And the reason I know that energy is involved is because I have two different points in time where I know velocities. I also know that there is, oh, I did forget the radius part. So we have a radius of 12 meters. So we'll call this R, and we'll say R is equal to 12 meters. And I have a change in height. So I know that energy has some bearing on this problem because of all of these things being present. Plus, roller coasters are a dead giveaway that energy is a relatively important quantity. So, I'm going to start with my conservation of energy statement. So I have K, and I want to do A and B because those are given. KA plus UGA plus UEA plus work done by some other force equals KB plus UGB plus UEB. So, I have this statement of conservation of energy, and I'm going to go through it, and I'm going to think about every single thing that's part of it, and cancel out things that are going to be zero. So, at A, I do have kinetic energy. Um, I can set my height at A to be zero, so I'm going to say that right here is uh, zero height. So, we'll say this is H equals zero. And then I know that B will be at two times the radius in height. So this height is going to be 24 meters. So since A I'm setting as zero, this term is zero. Um, there are no springs in this, so my elastic energies are both zero. And there is some work done by friction that's hinted at here. And I have some velocity at B, so there's kinetic energy. And there's gravitational potential energy because I'm 24 meters above where I started. So... Moving in to the next part, I'm going to plug in my equation. So I have 1 half mva squared plus the work done by, we'll say, friction is equal to 1 half k, I'm sorry, not k, let's undo that. So 1 half mvb squared plus mg and we'll say h at b, which is this height right here. So, so, the question is, how much work is done by friction? So I'm going to go ahead and isolate the work done by friction here. So moving this term over, so I have 1 half mvb squared minus, actually we'll go ahead and do plus mghb minus 1 half mva squared. So, and now we can substitute in all of the values that we have. So we have mass, we have both velocities or speeds, we have g, and we have height at b. So the work done by friction will be, in this case, 1 half times 120 times our velocity at b, which is 8 meters per second, square, and then we square that. Then we have 120 times our g, which we'll go ahead and use as 10. Our height at b is 24 meters minus 1 half times 120 
times our 25, which is our speed at A, squared. And when you plug this into a calculator, you should get negative, and I'm not going to round this, 4,860, and this will be in joules. So this is something we would expect. The work done by friction should be negative because it should be pulling energy out of our roller coaster car. For our second question in this set, we have 7.19. So we have a spring of neglig negligible mass with a force constant of 800 newtons per meter. So I'm going to go ahead and jot that down. K is 800 newtons per meter. So question part A says, how far must the spring be compressed for 1.2 joules of potential energy to be stored in it? So first off, this is a very simple question, actually. We just need to know that the energy stored in a spring, UE, and we can say us if you wanted to, is equal to 1 half k times our displacement squared. So this x, remember, is a simplification. It's actually displacement, not really position. Now, you actually can think of it as position uh, from or relative to the equilibrium position of the spring. So that's when it's not stretched or compressed. So the question says, how far must it be compressed for 1.2 joules of energy to be stored? So that's asking me uh, when UE equals 1.2 joules, what is X? So I'm going to go ahead and solve this little simple equation for X. So I'm going to actually do that in one big step. So I have 2 times my elastic potential energy divided by K, all square rooted. And I can just substitute in the values that I know for this. So that will be the square root of... 2 times 1.2 joules over my 800 newtons per meter. So I go and I plug this into my calculator, and you should get a very small 0 0.0, we'll say 55 for significant figure's sake, and that's going to be meters because joules involve meters and my spring constant involves meters so I can safely assume that my position will be measured in meters. So that's part A. Part B says I place the spring vertically with one end on the floor. So what is this talking about? Well let's go ahead and start setting up B over here. Uh, let's see we'll do a different color. So B will look like this. So my B will have the spring vertically on the floor. So here's my floor and here's my spring. That is terrible. Let's try that again. Let's start from the top. So there's my spring. So I place the spring vertically with one end on the floor, and then I lay a 1.6 kilogram book on top of the spring. So I'm going to put a book on top of this spring, and I'm going to assume it's not going to fall off, and the book has a mass of 1.6 kilograms. So I'm going to release the book from rest, and I want to know the maximum distance the spring would be compressed. So right here I have my spring with the book on top of it, and I am going to, from this state, obviously I'm going to compress the spring some amount. So my book is going to go down, my spring is going to get shorter, because I'm storing some energy in the spring. So the question is, what energy gets stored in the spring? So let's go ahead and take a look at the conservation of energy for this problem. So I have K, we'll just do one here, plus UG1, plus UE1, plus work other. So I'm gonna just do work of. Equals K2, plus UG2, plus UE2. Now, I start from rest, so my kinetic energy initial is zero. My gravitational potential energy zero is, or sorry, is not zero, All right? I start at some initial height and my book goes down. So I have some potential energy initially. Initially, my spring is unstretched before I let the book go. So I have no elastic potential energy initially. And there's no mention of friction or other forces. So we can probably assume that there's no weird work done. Once I let go of the book, it's going to squeeze the spring down and it will stop. So I have no kinetic energy at the end. Um, and now I can say that because I started at some initial height, 
and went down that this is height of zero, and then this we'll say is some other height, we'll just call that h, above zero height. So my gravitational potential energy after is going to be zero, and now my spring is compressed, so I have some elastic potential energy. So this is a very simple equation now, where we just have ug and ue2. So I'm going to go ahead and replace these. So I have mg. This is not the same color. Let me try this again. So I have mgh1 equals 1 half k, and we'll say this is x2 squared. So if I go through this, I have a little bit of a problem um, because I don't know h and I don't know x. So how are h and x related? Well, I know that h1 is going to be equal to the negative of x2. So what I can do is I can plug in negative h1 for x2, and since it's squared, it doesn't matter. So I can go ahead and rewrite this as mgh1 equals 1 half k times h1 squared. So Or, I mean, actually, since we're looking for the maximum distance the spring will be compressed, I guess it doesn't really matter which one you use in the end, since they're essentially the same. But we're just looking for this distance that the book moves or the spring is compressed. So we'll go ahead and leave it as H now. So that means that one of my H's will cancel out, leaving me with just H1 on the right. And that means that it's solving for H, so I'm going to move it to the left, will give me 2mg over K. So keep in mind, this is my spring constant k, not my kinetic energy k. I'm not doing a very good job of making sure that they are different. So plugging in my values, so 2 times the mass of the book, which was given to be 1.6 kilograms, times g, which we'll keep using 10, over my k, which was given to be 800. Go ahead and plug this in your calculator, and you get a height or a distance compressed of 0 point four meters. And I don't care that it's negative necessarily, I just care about the distance. So I don't care if it's negative. All right, so for our third question we have 7.24 and we have a two and a half kilogram block on a horizontal floor attached to a horizontal spring. So let's go ahead and start drawing up this problem. So we have Oop. horizontal it says. So let's uh, actually draw a line that's horizontal. So we have a horizontal ground and we have something to attach our spring to. We have a box and we have this spring attached to the wall. And let's go ahead and start marking this up. So our box has a mass of two and a half kilograms. Our spring has a force constant of 840 newtons per meter. I did not give myself enough room. And the spring is initially compressed 0.03 meters. So let's go ahead and say that this is initially compressed 0.03 meters. So x1 is 0.03. The floor is rough because there's a coefficient of friction. So we have some friction that's going on with a mu involved of 0.4. So the block and the spring are released from rest and the block slides along the floor. What's the speed of the block when it has moved a distance 0.02 from its initial position? So really we're looking at when it's at an x1. So we'll go ahead and mark that there's an x2 and that is at 0.01. So it's moved 0.02 slash x2 is at 0.01. So I'm gonna go ahead and say that the delta x, if we need it, is 0.02 meters. So, lots of stuff going on in this, but we are going to begin how we should every energy-related problem with conservation of energy. 
So we have K1 plus UG1 plus UE1 plus work. In this case, we'll say it's just done by friction. We'll skip a little bit here. Is equal to K2 plus UG2 plus UE2. So how are we going to figure all of this out? Because what we're looking for in the end is we're looking for the speed of the block. So we're looking for v2 in the end. So let's go ahead and see if we can cancel out any of this. So k1, well, we're released from rest. So k1 is 0 because v1 is 0. Our whole problem takes place on a horizontal floor. So the height the entire time is the same. So ug1 and ug2 would cancel out. Initially, we have some elastic potential energy, so that's fine. Uh, we don't really know the work done by friction yet, but we can figure that out in a moment. Um, we're looking for V2, and we have an elastic potential energy at point 0.2 because the spring is not completely compressed. So let's go in and let's look at the friction bit. So if I take my block and think about the forces acting on it, I have some weight or mg, I have a normal force, I have some force from the spring, and then I have a friction force as well. Well, I only really care about this friction force because the work done by friction is just going to be the friction force times, or I guess we should say not times, let's go ahead and do the uh, second bit here, which is uh, uh, sorry, S, that's what I was looking for. So F friction S cosine theta. So friction is going to the left, but displacement is going to the right. So I just need to know force of friction. Well, force of friction is going to come from normal force here because I have mu K times normal force times S times cosine theta in order to find the work done by friction. So my normal force comes from sum of forces in the y direction, which I can just say is normal minus mg, and I'm skipping some steps here because this is already a long problem. So my normal force is equal to mg. So my work done by friction can be written as mu k mg s cosine theta. A lot going on here. So cosine, or let's see, so um, let's go ahead and start setting this up. So the work done by friction Actually, let's go ahead and take this expression and plug it into our energy up here <clears throat> so that we can get a nice big symbolic solution. So UE1 is going to be 1 half KX1 squared plus the work done by friction, which is mu K M G S cosine theta. And because I wasn't very consistent with my variables, I'll go ahead and say that this X is my S. Then that's equal to 1 half mv2 squared plus 1 half kx2 squared. So I know everything in this situation except for v2, so I can go ahead and solve for that. So moving this around a little bit, I have 1 half mv2 squared equals 1 half kx1 squared plus mu k m g s cosine theta minus 1 half kx2 squared. Then to finally solve for v2, I have v2 equals, and so this is going to be, I'm just going to multiply by 2 over m times this whole thing, 1 half kx1 squared plus mu k m g s cosine theta minus one half k x two squared and then square root all of this. So this looks a little disgusting, but if you want to get better at symbolic problems, there you go. So now we can go ahead and plug in all of our known values. So I'm going to move this over a little bit so that I have room. So V, ooh, that's not a V. So V2 will be equal to square root of, so our mass is the mass of our box, so that's 2.5 kilograms, so 2 over 2.5, times 1 half K, our spring constant, is 840, 
times x1 squared, so that's our 0.03, don't forget to square it, plus mu k, which is 0.4 times m, so m here again is our mass, so that's 2.5, times g, let's use 10, times s, so our displacement, so this is the displacement that friction works through. That's 0.02 in this case, times cosine of theta. Well, theta in this case is going to be 180 degrees. Now the reason for that is our friction is to the left and our displacement is to the right. So if I think about this, so this is my S, this is my friction, so the angle between those two has to be 180 degrees. All right. Now we have minus one half, again k is 840, and our x2 is 0.01. Don't forget to square it. So once you finish all of that, don't forget to multiply by the 2 over 2.5, and then square root this whole business. So pause for a second, grab your calculator, and once you plug all that in, you should get a fantastic uh, 0 0.33 meters per second. So, I, I applaud you if you go through all of the trouble of finding this symbolic problem. It's very good to practice that when you can. So for question 31, we have our first calculus-based question for this problem set where we need to use our new definition of, not definition, our relation between force and the potential energy function. So my potential energy function here is given as u of x equals alpha x to the fourth. And alpha is given as this number right here. So it's 0.63 joules per meter to the fourth. So we want to know the force, both magnitude and direction, when the particle is at this position, x equals negative 0.8 meters. And if we're paying attention to sig figs, our answer should have three in the end. So I'm gonna go ahead and rewrite my potential energy function with my constant inserted. So that's gonna be 0 0.63 times x to the fourth. And I'll worry about units later. So my force, actually I'm gonna do it like this. My force as a function of x is equal to the negative derivative of my u of x, my potential energy function, dx. So that's the same as negative d dx of my potential energy function. So my force function will then be, so taking the derivative of this, so I'm going to have 4 times my 0 0.63 times x now raised to the third. So I will also make sure I remember this negative sign, which I almost forgot. So now this is negative of all of this. So if I go through this, I now want to know the F value at negative 0.8. Oops. Ah, I'll just go ahead and erase that. So negative 0.8. And so that'll be negative. I'm just not I'm going to leave it and do it all at the same time. So negative 4 times 0.63 times negative 0.8 cubed. So the force for this will be, plug it in your calculator, a negative, or sorry, a positive now, 1.29. And let's go ahead and check our units real quick. So my units would be joules per meter to the fourth is the, value, or the units for the 0.63, and then times meters cubed would give me joules per meter. So joules, if you remember, are kilograms times meters squared per second squared over, now this is a meter, so my meter goes away, and I'm left with kilograms times meters per second squared, which is in fact a newton. So I know I did this right. So it's 1.29 newtons, and the direction will be in the positive x direction because my value came out as positive. 
So question 7.36 gives us a potential energy function for a marble moving on the x-axis. So we'll go ahead and point out some of the features of this before we go into the questions. So our potential energy function has a minimum right here at the x-coordinate b. It has a local maximum at the x-coordinate d, and then it's crossing the x-axis at a and c. So in order to go into our questions here, question a asks us which of the label or at which of the labeled x coordinates is the force on the marble zero so this is an application of our new relationship that f of x is equal to negative du of x dx or force is the negative slope of the u of x function so which of the slopes would be zero? So there are actually two locations where the force on the marble is zero. That is where the tangent line would be zero. And so we have that at B and D. So uh, we will say that the force is zero at B and D. Now the next part asks which of the labeled x coordinates is a position of stable equilibrium. So stable equilibrium just means that, that's not a Q, stable equilibrium just means that, <laughs> I can't write a Q, stable equilibrium means that any perturbation, so if I push it one way or the other, the system will go back to equilibrium. Instead of moving away. So, out of these, if I were to perturb it at D, you can see that this object would move toward a lower potential energy. So, an object will always move toward lower potential energy. So if we're looking for a stable equilibrium, we want a valley, we want a minimum in order to get to an equilibrium position. So our stable equilibrium would only be at location B because that is a minimum, right? This is because U of X is a minimum or a local minimum if you're really getting into it. It doesn't have to be global. Finally, we have a point of unstable equilibrium. And so this is the opposite, right? So we can have equilibrium, which when there is zero force, however, any perturbation, so an unstable equilibrium here, any perturbation, the system will not return. So it does not readily return. And so for this situation, if I push it away from D, it will go away from D and not come right back. So this is my location of unstable equilibrium. Please make sure that you know what these points, these critical points on a potential energy function look like. So question 7.41 is another roller coaster problem. This time it is a frictionless roller coaster. And that means that we're just going to go straight into conservation of energy. So we have two points, A and B. So we're going to go ahead and just state our conservation of energy between points A and B before we even care about what the question is. So we will have, uh, let's go ahead and use a darker color. So we have K a plus u g a plus u e a plus work done by other forces equals k b plus u g b plus u e b. So out of all of these, uh, we'll actually go ahead and look at the question. So how fast is this roller coaster moving at b? So at point a, it starts at rest. So my kinetic energy at A is zero. 
I have some initial potential due to gravity because I'm at some height above the ground. And I have no elastic potential energy. There's no springs or anything mentioned. And it says frictionless, so no work done by other forces. At B, we are moving. We have some initial height. And again, we have no spring mentioned of any kind. So for part A, we are looking for the velocity at B. So I'm going to go ahead and pull down my uh, conservation of energy statements. So I have mg, and we'll say height at A, equals 1 half mvb squared plus mg height at B. So we can go ahead and solve this for velocity at B, get better at symbolic questions. So we have 1 half mvb squared is equal to mg times, we'll go ahead and just do it like this, height a minus height b. And then to solve for m, well, actually, we can cancel out m. So let's go ahead and do that. We don't need the m. We have vb, eh, we'll go ahead and square root it as well. So vb is equal to 2g times h a minus h b square rooted. So my velocity at b, I'm going to be plugging in some values here. So I have square root of 2 times, we'll go ahead and use 10. My height at location a is 25 meters. Height b, my location or my height is 12 meters. Oops, I just wrote h a, didn't I? So we have 25 minus 12. And so the velocity of our roller coaster at B will be 16.1 meters per second. So that's our velocity at B, or our speed at B, rather. Now, B, part B, asks us, how hard does it press against the track at point B? So this is an interesting situation. So B is asking us, all right, here's my track, and my cart is here. So it is pushing against the track. And how do I know what force is pushing against the track? Well, I have two forces acting on this card at this time. I have the force of gravity, and I have a normal force. Which of these actually deals with how much it's pushing into the track? Well, that is just the normal force. So I want to know the normal force acting on this cart. So from the sum of forces, centripetally acting, I would have, we'll just go ahead and say down is positive, Fn plus mg equals mac, or we can write that as mvb squared over r. So again, I'm looking for normal force, so my normal force would be mvb squared over r minus mg. So what is this normal force? Well, we have our mass, which is given to be 350 kilograms. So I'm we'll going to write that m equals 350 kilograms. And we actually need to figure out our r as well. So our r, so we're assuming this loop touches the ground. And so our r is going to be half of this 12. So this is our r. So our r will be 12 divided by 2, or just 6 meters. So our normal force then would be 350 kilograms times the velocity at b we just found, 16.1 squared, divided by 6 meters minus 350 times, we'll go ahead and use 10 again for g, and we plug all this into our calculator, and we find the normal force acting on the cart to be approximately 11,600, we could say 620, but let's go ahead and say 600 newtons. And so that is the force with which the car is pressing into the track or by which the track is press or by, yeah, the track is pressing into the car. So question 7.53 is a potato question. I know you're excited. So we have a 
0.3 kilogram potato, and it's tied to a string with length two and a half meters, and it's tied to a rigid support. The potato is held straight out horizontally from the point of support with the string pulled taut and then released. So what does that look like? So I have some rigid support and I attach a string to this. Actually, let's go ahead and use um, the blues. So I have a rigid support and I attach a string to it. So here is my rigid support. Here is my potato and it is attached by a string and held out horizontally. The string has a length of two and a half meters. The potato has a mass of 0.3 kilograms and it's held taut and released. So first off, what is the speed of the potato at the lowest point of its motion? So my potato will undergo some circular motion and end up down here. And that will do some interesting things regarding energy. So let's go ahead and take a look at it. So what is the speed of the potato? So I'm gonna start with my conservation of energy. So I have K1 plus UG1 plus UE1 plus work other equals K2 plus UG2 plus UE2. So simplifications. So initially I'm holding the potato at rest, no kinetic energy. Initially, my potato can go down, so I can set this location as a height of zero, and this location will be, well, since this is moving circularly, since it's tied to a string, this has to be also two and a half meters. So this would be height two, and this would be height one. So I have some initial potential energy. I have no elastic potential energy, nothing here seems stretchy, and no mention of friction, so We'll say there's no additional work. K2, yes, my potato is moving as it is swinging, but my gravitational potential is now zero because I can go no lower. And then I again have no spring or stretchy material. So I have only gravitational initial and kinetic final. So I can replace these with MGH1 equal to one half K, I'm sorry, not K, M, v2 squared. And I'm looking for the speed of the potato here. So v2 will be equal to, so my mass cancels out again. How convenient. So my mass cancels out and I have v2 is equal to 2g h1 square rooted. So v2 will end up being 2 times 10 times my initial height of 2.5 meters. So V2 will end up being, once you plug it into your calculator, 7.07 .07 meters per second. Now question B asks us, what is the tension in the string at this point? So in order to find the tension, I have to think about forces again. So once my potato is down here, what forces are acting on it? Well. I have force of gravity, or mg, acting downward, and I have some tension, which is probably larger than this, acting up. So the sum of forces, and since I'm moving circularly, I'm gonna say the sum of forces centripetally will be my tension force minus mg is equal to mac, or mv2 squared over r. So my tension force then has to be mv2 squared over r plus mg. So what is r? Well, r is just this two and a half meters. So my tension force can be solved now. So my mass of the potato comes in play now, my 0.3 kilograms times the 7.07 .07 I just found squared over my radius of two and a half meters plus 0.3 times, we'll go ahead and use 10. And so plugging all this in to find my tension, I get very close, I'm gonna round this, 9.0 newtons. So our final question in the minimum suggested problems involves um, 
a truck loading station at a post office with a small package that you can see here of mass 0.2 kilograms that is released from point A at rest on a track that is a quarter circle of radius 1.6 meters. So the size of the package can be treated, uh, it's just as something like, you can basically treat it as a single particle rather than something that's physical. So it has no tipping or anything. It slides down the track, reaches point B, where it has a speed of, I'm gonna go ahead and jot this into my picture. So it has a speed of 4.8 meters per second. And from point B, it slides on this surface three meters until it comes to rest. So at VC, I have no speed. What is the coefficient of kinetic friction on the horizontal surface? So in order to figure this out, we need to figure out what force is acting on this. So real quick, we know that my block has a force of friction acting on it to the left and that's it horizontally. And then I have mg down and normal force as well. So in this situation, since I have no pushing up or pushing down, I can actually skip pretty far ahead and just know that force of friction is equal to mu k times normal. And just looking at this, you should be able to tell hopefully at this point that the normal force is equal to mg. Therefore, my force of friction will just be um, mu k m g. So how am I going to figure out mu? Well, I could do kinematics to find a because I could say that this is equal to m a x. I could also use energy. So since this is an energy unit, let's go ahead and do energy. So it does say how much work is done on the package by friction as it slides down the circular arc. Well, uh, we do need to find work eventually, so you can really choose either kinematics to find acceleration and then mu, or you can do energy in both cases if you wanted to. If you do energy in both cases, you're going to find the work done by friction for this section, and then you can go and do the work part for this curved section. So let's actually go ahead and do both. So let's go ahead and do kinematics here, because if you're more comfortable with kinematics, you should do that. So which equation do I want to use? Well, I want to find acceleration. So I know V, initial and final. I know the delta. I know the delta X in this case. And I know that I'm looking for acceleration. So I'm going to go ahead and use the third kinematic equation, which is going to be VC, or final, squared equals VB squared plus 2A delta X. And so if I solve for A in this case, that will be VC squared minus VB squared over two delta X. So my acceleration will be zero minus 4.8 squared over two times three, which if I plug this into my calculator, I would get a negative 3.84 meters per second squared. So there's my acceleration. So now I can go into my forces again. So my force of friction is going to be, actually, I'm not gonna do that. So my sum of forces in the horizontal direction would be mu k mg equals m a x. So my m's cancel and leaving and leaves me mu k is equal to a x over g, which substituting my negative 3.84 meters per second squared over my G of 9.8 meters per second squared. And uh, this should be negative, I believe. Yes, it should be. Because this, when I plug in my forces, should be negative as well. So my, so it should be negative here. So my mu k is going to end up being, and I guess you could have used a 10 here. I used 9.8 because I don't, it's the only time we've used it in this homework. So my mu ends up being pretty much 0.39 or 0.384 if you use 10. So there is my coefficient of kinetic friction. Now, I need that coefficient because in B, I need to know how much work is done on the package by friction as it slides down the circular arc. Well, 
I could do the UK, the mu k here and find the path length, but the problem is, is that the normal force changes for this entire time. So Fn will be changing. So I can't really do the Newton's laws application in order to find out work in this case, because Fn changes, so the force of friction changes. So I don't really know how to go about doing that. But thankfully, I can use conservation of energy. So for B, I'm gonna start with my conservation of energy statement from A to B. So I have Ka plus Uga plus Uea plus the work done by the friction is equal to K at B plus Ug at B plus Ue at B. So let's make some simplifications. I start from rest, so my initial kinetic energy is zero. I do have some initial gravitational potential energy. I have no springs or elastic material. I know there's friction, so I'm looking for this in the end. Kb, well, I am moving at B, so I have kinetic energy. I have no longer any gravitational potential. Then finally, I have no more elastic in this whole problem. So, going to the next step, I have mg height at A plus the work done by friction, which I'll be solving for in a moment, is equal to one half mvb squared. So the work done by friction here is just going to be the difference between the kinetic energy at B and the initial potential energy at A. So this is much easier than having to do any integrals as far as um, work done over a circular path. So I will now substitute. So I have one half my mass of the block. I need to go hook up. It's been a moment. Is 0.2 kilograms. So I have 0.2 times my 4.8 squared minus 0.2 times, we'll keep using 9.8 for this problem because we should be consistent at least through a problem, times my height A. Well, my height A is gonna be equal to this radius since it only goes through a quarter circle, so that will be 1.6 meters. So take all of this, plug it into your calculator, and you get the work done by friction to be a negative 0.83 or 0.832, and that's gonna be joules. So it did work out to be negative, which is good news for us because friction should be pulling some energy out of my system.